I'm happiest in the saddle. <laughs> A fellow sportsman. I am an FBI agent. Great Scott. What do you say we cut the chit chat? A hole. Dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. Come with me if you want to live. Hello, and welcome to Retro Ramble. I'm Charlie McGee. I'm George McGee. And this time, listeners, we are retro rambling all the way back to 1993 to take another look at what is known as one of the best modern westerns, Tombstone. So, George, who brought us this film? It is 1993. Uh, who's the director? George P. Cosmatos, uh, which is a real name. He is. He was a real person. He also gave us a film that we frequently touch on in this podcast, but have yet to cover. Rambo First Blood Part 2 Oh my god The only way to survive this podcast Is to become this podcast this Podcast. Uh, yeah no I, lo- I look forward I mean Every dog will have its day We're gonna get We're gonna do that uh, We're gonna do Star Wars We're gonna do Bond There's some There's a lot of big movies We've not done And uh, Rambo too And Rambo too Yeah so um, Oh come on Come on So, th- uh, so th- this is I believe This is our first western Is it not? That we've covered on the podcast uh, you know what my memory's like, so I w- I'm going to say it is. Probably. <laughs> Probably. Probably. I think you're right. And, you know, who, who's going to go back that far back over the last few years and check all of our podcasts? Maybe before? our listeners. But before we finish recording, no, we're, we're, we're safe for now. I can edit it out later. We'll pretend we knew. Character actors, are there, are there any big actors in this film? Who have we got? Who have we got? We've got... There's one uh, or two famous people in this film. Yeah, so uh, Kurt Russell, Val Kilmer, Bill Paxton, Sam Elliott, Powers Booth, Stephen Lang. Michael uh, Bean. Michael Bean. Charlton uh, freaking Heston. Billy fucking Zane. Billy Z- <laughs> Kramit Zane. Jason Priestley. Oh my uh, God! Yes, Priestley. Yeah. Narrated by Robert Mitchum. Yeah, I mean uh, this film is stacked and it it delivers. So this is going to be we don't know. This is going to be a typical retro ramble episode. We enjoyed this film when we were younger. I think it means different things to us now. We still I I enjoy going back to watch it, but I'm going to talk about that in more detail just coming up. Uh, George, anything you want to say before I release the trailer? If this is your first time listening to Retro Ramble, thank you for for joining us. Charlie and I are brothers. This is a lighthearted look back at the films of our youth. We will go into the film and just see here if it stands up and some production trivia, how the film came about, how it was made, who were, might have been cast in the film, that sort of thing. Along the way, you know, we'll, we'll poke a bit of fun, we'll have a bit of fun with it. Uh, so expect some childish language, some bad impressions. Ultimately, we aim to entertain and get you, our dear listener, to maybe go and revisit the film if you haven't in a while. Yeah, I mean, these are, uh, we're going to go back and remember why we enjoyed these films when we were younger. Um, And I think we agreed, I think everybody kind of agrees the same thing about this film. Uh, It was groundbreaking at the time, and we're going to be diving in and around. Plundering nostalgia, that's our our bag, baby. Exactly. Everybody else is doing it, so why can't we? So hot right now. uh, Without further ado, here it is, Tombstone. 1993. Enjoy the show. Enjoy. It was a place where a man could start over, where a fortune could be made. They say every town has a story. Tombstone as a legend. Who is he? That's Wider. Better name for himself as a peace officer. I heard of you. I'm retired. You must be Doc Holliday. You retired too? Not me. I'm in my prime. Hollywood Pictures presents The only real law around here is the Cowboys. The story of Wyatt Earp. The first time in our lives we got a chance to stop wandering and finally be a family. Now this is trouble we don't need. If we're gonna have a future in this town, it's gotta have some law and order. What do you want, Ringo? I want your blood. I want your soul. I want them both right now. 
shot your brother. Now the time has come for justice. Guess maybe you better swear me in. And he has to live up to his reputation. You got a fight coming. I'll be there! One last time. None of your problem, Doc. You don't have to mix up a nest. That is a hell of a thing for you to say to me. In a battle. The last charge of wired up and his immortals. At the OK Corral. Oh my God. The West would never forget. Kurt Russell, Val Kilmer, Dana Delaney, Powers Booth, Michael Bean, Bill Paxton, Jason Priestley, Sam Elliott, and Charlton Heston. Justice is coming to Tombstone. I'm your Huckleberry. I'm going to have to have a mustache warning on this on this episode somewhere. A mustache disclaimer. <laughs> Dangerous levels of mustaches. No facial hair was harmed during the making of this film. So, George, it's 1993. We get Tombstone, uh, much to Kevin Costner's disliking, but we'll get back to Kevin later. How did we get this movie? Well, uh, let's go back a few years. Let's go back to October. We've already gone back to 1993. The machine doesn't work again. Oh, in, with our imagination. Imaginations. Okay. Let us okay. go but travel back to October 26, 1881. Right. So the gunfight at the OK Corral was uh, the most famous shootout in the history of the American Old West. Apparently, it was a 30-second shootout between lawmen led by Virgil Earp and members of a loosely organized group of outlaws called the Cowboys. So, uh, yeah, 30 shots were fired in 30 seconds, but... It wasn't really well known until uh, a a book was written in 1931 by a guy called Stuart Lake. And it was a biography all about Wyatt Turp called Wyatt Earp Frontier Marshal. And that was after two years after Wyatt Earp uh, died. But apparently uh, Wyatt Earp uh, later in his life became a consultant on uh, some of the early Westerns in Hollywood when he moved to Hollywood in 1915. So he frequently visited the sets of several silent films, including some directed by John Ford, who's like one of the most legendary uh, Western directors. So there's been countless movies made about Wired Up and the, the, the gunfight at the OK Corral over the years, some of them very famous, like My Darling Clementine and the film that's called Gunfight. The at Gunfight okay, at the OK, OK Corral. Corral. <laughs> Uh, as with any sort of true story, uh, the films have played fast and loose with the facts. And it turns out that the uh, the book that a lot of it was based on, Frontier Marshall, was uh, based on eight interviews with Wyatt Earp and was largely fictional. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes, Wyatt's uh, reputation and mystique has definitely been blown up and inflated because of the whole Hollywood myth and Western myth. So that's it's. I would say it's one of those most classic Western tales. And if you think about, I mean, I studied uh, westerns a bit at um, in my degree and stuff like that. And it's you know American myth that American their history only goes back pretty much like a couple of hundred years. So that's why there's so much focus on that Western myth, that creation. And so it's a bit of a weird one. Obviously, there was hundreds or thousands of, of uh, you know, it was a very popular genre pretty much up until I think the 70s. And then it started petering out. And it again, it's sort of, it's like one of these things recently, it's, it's one of those genres that hasn't really died out completely. You know, you still get the odd Western that crops up. I mean, even um, this year, one of the big Oscar films, Power of the Dog, that's a Western. So they're still, you know, liked and people still go back to, but just, not as prolific as as they once were, but to get round to my my point, yeah, around that there wasn't many. You know, we haven't covered many this off first western uh, because there wasn't that many in the eighties and nineties. But 
if you were to draw up a list, uh, this would be right up there. In terms of where where we were at in, in with westerns, it's like you you can understand the obsession, you know, lawlessness. And I think this is this is so much what the the U.S. culture is about. I mean, can you imagine a world without lawyers? There's a lot of law and order is a very big facet of American culture, and and, and mm. I think it goes back to this time and sheriffs. And I mean, you know, it's so much in the news well, about it's, gun control. You know, it, it dates. Well, this is where it comes from. Yeah, but if you also go like the, the more optimistic side, it's all about the American dream, going out and making your fortune out west. The land of the free. Yeah, and make- and that, that's very much what White Earp's doing. Him and his brothers, uh, you know, they've, they're giving up law giving and they just want to make some money. Yeah, so uh, what a cast. What an amazing cast to have in this film. I think we both, uh, at the time, I can remember us talking about this film at the time and we were, and I think everyone else was on the... I mean, just with that cast being announced, it was just such a crowd pull. It was just like, then you saw the posters and the, there was just that tagline, justice is coming. And I was, I don't know, just these, these they were all actors who'd been in our favourite films at the time, you know? Well, it's, it's weird because I remember it, yeah, but like obviously Kurt Russell, synonymous with the 80s, Val Kilmer was was huge. You know, his, his star was like, he was like, not probably not even at his peak at that point, or probably was around the, the sort of the mid nineties. Uh, you know, obviously this is a couple of years before Batman, but we'll we'll get on to that. It was after uh, Top Secret though. After after Top Secret uh, and Top Gun. But the thing I forget about is yeah, how many like small players are in this that were either big at the time or have gone on to like have a bigger career. So people like you could argue, you know, Stephen Lang has had a bigger career now. Obviously, that's helped being him like cropping up. He's always been a bit of a character actor, but him popping up in as a villain in Avatar is obviously, you know, one of the biggest, Amazing. most successful uh, films ever. Yeah, it's got so many of the who's who's, you know, Michael Bean playing playing a bad guy, hissably. Bad ass. He's bad brilliant ass, in this. And even Michael Rooker is in a tiny role. And it's it's great to see love so- that. I love it. And he's so so bright eyed and young. He really, he's, he's the young guy. He's the young yeah. guy who's taking advantage of. But as you say, you know, Billy Zane, you know, Billy he was fucking he, he was a really big actor then, and it's a relatively small role for him. So it's interesting how many People were in it and maybe just drawn to the project of it's it's the wide up story with, you know, the who's who with, you know, it's going to be big. It's going to be big. And maybe that's people will just want to be on it. I would argue that the fact that we went back, that, that there were, were you were talking about how there hadn't been Westerns for a few years. I feel like we got Desperado and we got a few other, you know, Westerns uh, with that tinge to it after Tombstone. Um, yeah. Well, obviously, I think... Um, I'm trying to think. I think it was Unforgiven around the same time. I think Un- Unforgiven, Unforgiven might be was nine, later. 92. No, I think is it's it, early. Oh, is it, it's earlier. I That's think it East, might be. Is that Eastwood? It's Eastwood, isn't it? Yes. And obviously with, with Unforgiven, it's, yeah, Unforgiven's 92. And with Unforgiven, there's so much baggage with that, you know, in terms of emotional baggage, because it's it's Eastwood returning to the genre and it's all about, you know, the aging gunfighter when he's, you know, made a role about, that f- from his youth so yeah i think that's another film that we will probably have to revisit because that is probably well arguably some would say one of the best uh westerns ever made no, no never mind just the ni- 80s or 90s um okay well, that, that, that'd be an our clint eastwood special because i don't think we know enough about the man to probably cover film by film for our audience but i think we should definitely do a clint eastwood special at some point no i mean i uh for my my degree i did a lot of the spaghetti westerns well, is that where it. he copies um michael Chris j Tower. fox he yes. copies Michael J. Fox with the uh, the thing in his thing to stay alive. That is yeah. that is correct. Yeah, he did uh, it first. Technically, Michael te- J. Fox did it first. Technically, uh, in his time machine. But anyway, <laughs> we're okay. We're going we're get, subject. But let's so let's. let's well, we were talking about the cast. So we talked about. Um, co- should we, we, should we about, board our, the steam train to production production country? I, I thought you covered the production chat. No, no, you were talking about uh, no. That was my in general. That, that was my intro to the western. So um, this is um, the this film, Tombstone, is from writer slash 
director, that's a loose term, uh, Kevin Kevin Jarre, who bizarrely is the stepbrother of Jean-Michel Jarre, electro extraordinaire uh, yeah. that's obviously uh, stuck a, in a still stuck in a cage of sense in to a, this day in a cage of sense jean michel jar meow, 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 meow. so anyway yeah kevin jar was a was a screenwriter has a story credit again on rambo first blood part 2 he then went on to write uh, Oscar-winning film Glory, which is all about the Civil War. I have not seen it. Have you? I remember it. I remember yeah. it being advertised and thinking, that looks a bit too dramatic and bloody for my liking. Yeah. Not enough car chases or bone and arrows. Or full frontal female nudity. <laughs> Calm uh, down, uh, Sorry, that's, I'm thinking of Roadhouse. Yeah, he would go on to uh, also write Navy Seals. There's, there's another <gasps> classic. Oh, Michael Bean again. 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 And would then go on to be one of the writers of the 1999 uh, Brendan Fraser Mummy movie, which I'm sure we'll cover at some point. You know, I uh, was thinking about Navy Seals the other day. I was thinking about <laughs> if I fell into the water from here, would I die? And then I was like, oh, yeah. Sorry, spoiler alert. The guy in Navy Seals, like, yeah, because like if you fall from a certain height, it's like cement. So, yeah, Navy Seals, it's still there. It's still there. It's still still there. there. That, that, still that there. was on Back in my rotation. Mind. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, so so anyway, yeah, he um, wrote wrote the script, and he originally was was penciled to direct. Originally planned to make it with Kevin Costner. And, that name again sounds familiar. Come and on. then Kevin Costner had different ideas about what he wanted to do with the the White Earp story. So creative differences. <laughs> yes. So Kevin Costner said, "Okay, well, you know, you do your thing." I'm going to do my thing. And Kevin, I Costner, think we can both be adults uh, about this. <laughs> I mean, it's not like I'm going to storm off and make my own film. And, about yeah, up. <laughs> and apparently wished, wished him good luck. And so Kevin Costner went off and took his idea to Lawrence Kasdan, who's a good friend of Kevin Costner. They worked together quite a bit. Lawrence Kasdan, probably most famously, is the Empire Strikes Back screenwriter or something. And Raiders. But he also directed stuff. and wrote Silverado uh, with Costner. Um, and I think he wrote the original script for Bodyguard as well. So, yeah, him and Costner were, were tight. Originally, I think it was going to be a miniseries, but I I've still to this day haven't seen the Kevin Costner Wyatt movie because I'm, I think everyone said it's really slow, it's really dull. But it's bizarre if you think about how successful Dances with Wolves was and, you know, arguably, you know, was... Re- reignited, reinvigorated, you know, interest in the Western. And so a Kevin Costner wide at movie versus a, a Kurt Russell one, you, your money would probably be on Costner, wouldn't it? Well, retrospectively, I would say no, but back then probably Costner was so yeah. big. You know? so, so, well, apparently Costner also then had uh, quite a bit of clout. So there's... Um, Are you talking very- about how he was totally okay with them continuing in their project? And oh, yeah, wouldn't yeah. Do, wouldn't do Absolutely. anything to hamper the uh, production. So, yeah, there's a very revealing interview with Kurt Russell in True West magazine. There's an article uh, in 2006. That Ad- that's the Adam West monthly magazine. <laughs> if if no, that's, that's pure West. Um, so, so this yeah. is a Western magazine, right? It's a Western magazine web- okay. website type thing. And and they basically have it. Uh, they're doing, uh, I think, Kurt Russell's on the press junket for the, the remake of Poseidon. And he's just like, I can't be asked to talk about that. A film do you want to do you want to know some gossip about tombstone and he just basically goes nuts and reveals all and apparently he's really like uh polite about well it, he's very i don't know if polite's a word but he's he, 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 has, he talks about it in in high spirits but he basically says that's Kurt um, russell he's such a nice guy he's like he's, he's like keanu reeves he's like well you know he's just always seems fun and friendly yeah and he just takes it a face value but he said with um basically costner's reputation and clout they when uh so kurt russell um was working with uh, uh andy wagner who was you know part of uh, andy wagner and mario cassar did loads of films together from Col- uh, carlico pictures um 
So he, um, they were trying to get the financing, trying to find a dis- distributor. And apparently Kevin Costner was just basically telling all the big studios, no, don't work with them. Don't work with them. And he basically shut down everywhere. And the only place that they could get distribution was with uh, Buena Vista. Oh, is this is- how Buena Vista got involved? Oh, right. Yeah. So that makes more sense now. Because because it was the only option that they had, because apparently the yeah um, Costner had such a, a reputation uh, in Hollywood that he managed to convince all the other studios to to give him a pass, which is, yeah, obviously, yeah, good luck with your movie. I'm just going to make sure it doesn't happen. I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter at all. But th- this is what uh, Russell says. He says, um, Costner was powerful enough at the time, which I always respected. I thought it was good hardball. <laughs> so, like, as yeah, I say, yeah. he did, he Respect. Like, You've got he some like balls, Costner. <laughs> yeah, he's just, just like, well, you know. I respect his, yeah, his showmanship. But um, so, yeah, as I say, it was due to be um, Kevin Jarre's first job as director, but he, he was quickly overwhelmed and was falling behind schedule. So uh, Andy Wagner fired him a month into shooting and was replaced with uh, George P. Cosmatos. So George P. Cosmatos, I say most famously, he's done a bunch of films. He did um, a bunch of warm films. I think Escape to Athena with Roger Moore um, that I haven't seen yet, but I, I've, I've got on my list. Um, but yeah, he most famously directed Rambo 2. But uh, it turns out George P. Cosmatos wasn't really the director. Uh, as Kurt Russell reveals in this interview. So apparently, it was Kurt. yeah, Andy Wagner said they wanted Kurt Russell to take over the movie. And he said, I'll do it, but I don't want to put my name on it. I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be seen as like, you know, a control freak. And bizarrely, Kurt Russell, this is a tango and cash connection. Kurt Russell calls up Stallone. He's like, I need to find a director. Just a guy's basically you know, a ghost director to call, and uh, Stallone's like, oh, well, why don't you use George P. Cosmatos? I used, I did the same thing on Rambo 2. <laughs> I kind of took control, got this yeah. guy in. He knows, yeah. he knows, he knows how to pay attention and do what he's told. <laughs> exactly. Pre- yeah, pretty much. And um, Kurt Russell went up to him and was like, I'm going to give you a shot list every night and that's what it's going to be. Play um, by play. He goes, oh, George, I don't want any arguments. This is what it is. This is what the job is. And uh, in respect, um, Kurt Russell said, whilst you're alive, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say a thing. And apparently this interview was done a couple of years after Cosmatos died. It was 13 his film. years. It was his film. But um, most people have, have come out and said, yeah, yeah, that, that was the case. Like uh, Val Kilmer said, I have such admiration for Kurt as he basically sacrificed lots of energy that would have gone into his role to save the film. Everyone cared, don't get me wrong, but Kurt put his money where his mouth was and not a lot of stars extend themselves for the cast and crew, not like he did. So apparently one of the first things that uh, Kurt Russell did was went back and slashed back. The, I, I think the film was going to be much bigger in scope and probably much longer. But because of it was overrunning, Kurt Russell's like, right, we've got to cut this back. How do we make it shorter? And as a result, cut back a lot of his own character development. And the key thing that he kept was obviously the relationship between him and Doc Holliday. But uh, apparently George uh, P. Cosmatos was a, a very um, a good man for detail, historical detail in terms of uh, costumes, props, scenery, and apparently all the moustaches in the movie are real. I've read this because I think everybody checks. It's one of the most checked things about if you tap in Tombstone, the most query thing about Tombstone is, is Kurt Russell's moustache real? And I think it came up so much that he had a, he had a way of describing it in Junkets. It was like, uh, he had a line. It wasn't the, the man wearing the moustache. It was the moustache that wore the man. Is how he described it. Uh, <laughs> yes, it well, took I mean, months you, of it, growing. His, uh, and we've seen him recently in the, Santa, say, the Santa Claus film and in the uh, Guardians Two, Guardians of the Galaxy Two. That man has an amazing. Is, um, he's well, he's Santa done a few uh, westerns yeah. recently. Like, no, no, uh, Bone oh, of course, yeah, the filthy, which the, fi- the filthy, the, and, the hateful uh, eight, the hateful eight, uh, isn't that? What he's hateful called? eight, yeah. Great tash in that. Okay, so that is the majority of the production chat, George. How, what was it like going back and watch this film, you know, today? 
Well, it's a weird one. Um, I don't remember watching this lot as kids. I remember watching it in bits. I don't remember watching the film from start to finish. And I don't know if it's just something catching it on when it was on TV or uh, random parties or whatever. But yeah, I think I've only rewatched it like a couple of times in the past few years. But it's one of those films that I say because of the story because of the cast and it's such a good cast um i think it's just one of those things that makes you sort of go back and watch and you know yeah to to go back to that point it does look fantastic as well um in terms of the it feels like i don't know a, a proper hardcore western like there is so much attention to detail in terms of the guns the the outfits the the mustaches and everything but from, I don't know, I, I, I don't really have much memory, first memories, that's what I'm saying. My first memories of this, I, I can be completely honest, because I picked up this film, I think I watched, I watched this film on video, so it was still, we weren't in DVDs. It was like, you know, but I didn't see the cinema. I remember the marketing, though. It was everywhere. I remember the it was, poster. It was, it was massive. Yeah. And it was at Justice is Coming. It and the long, massive. dark coats. Yeah, and then yeah. walking along. It was massive in the cinema. I just remember it being all over HMV and everything. It was like Tombstone, Tombstone, Tombstone. And everyone's like, oh, it's an amazing film. And, and it was like one of those films that was back then, pre-internet, super hyped, just by yeah. word of mouth. Well, and I think, I think because of that competition as well, because of that time of, oh, there's going to be two... There's, good, there's a Kevin Costner movie and there's a Kurt Russell movie. And as you know, we were saying, like Costner was a huge star. Kurt was no slouch. You know, he was still, you know, he was always, you know, an A list actor. He was, he was big enough uh, back then, I would say. And I say Val Kilmer was so hot. So, yeah, it was, it was a really like because of that competition, I think that helped hype it up as well. I just, I all, so I, that's what I remember. I remember the marketing. I remember mm. seeing it everywhere. I think we, this came out when we covered Roadhouse recently. It's like, we'd never seen I, Roadhouse. I remember but, the poster. But we'd seen that poster fucking everywhere our entire life. We just hadn't sat down and watched the film from start to finish. And Tombstone was kind of similar to that, but I definitely, it was one of those that I picked up, um, uh, you know, when, when you're at uni and, you know, you might be working and you're just, you're just watching films all day. Um, no, but there were certain days where you're just watching films and, this was one of them and I remember being uh, not getting the performance of Val Kilmer the first time I have watched it since um, and not just when we for, for this episode but being I was expecting more action from him and like he's you know he's always on the back foot he's like he's ill and he's doing this amazing performance you know but he's like you know he's the no, but just saying like if, if anything's like how ill is he i mean he's just like literally on death's door throughout the whole film For the entire like, film and sweating it's like it, and, uh, but it's not like the film happens over two three days it's like this guy's been dying for like for months but like yeah i think i was when I was like, when I saw the cast lineup, I think, and what's is what's weird, it, it does kind of tie in with how I feel about going back and watching this film now is that the bits I remember that I loved, I still love today, you know, and mm. there's some set pieces, there's some performances, there's some scenes in this that I still love today. Uh, but as we do on Retro Ramble, we, we are, look at these films under the, the microscope a bit more. And yeah, I think we both agree that we feel like some of it's a bit jarring towards the third act. Well, it's weird because um, you and I haven't really talked about this pre-recording. I just said, I've got some mixed feelings about this film, but you're, you're jumping to conclusions that I have issues with the third act. And can I shock you? I have issues with the third act. Um, but no, I think I think just want to have a sort of quick disclaimer. I don't want to get into Tango and Cash uh, territory, but I just want to say to sort of people listening, I know that this film is beloved by a lot of people. It's a lot of people's favourite Western. But yeah, as Charlie was saying, this podcast is an opportunity to say, okay, what does it do well? What does it n not do well? And yeah, for me, I think this film is fantastic. It's got an amazing cast. And right up until the battle at the OK Corral, it's fantastic. But then when it goes on that whole revenge mission, it just it just feels really messy and hastily cut together. And I'm not sure because of they were under pressure because of you know the director being fired and budget constraints and and what have you. But it feels definitely that last 45 minutes. Uh, feels uh, or half an hour feels very messy and a bit anticlimactic as well. 
I think that's the word that I come to now. My, I, I was trying to be uh, very, you know, uh, fair to fair to the film, and I, I, and what I felt watching this film, I was like, it just the 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 tempo and like how things are being explained. Going back because this is what we do in this podcast, we go back and watch it and see does it live up to the memory, you know? Yeah. And my theory is that this is so fact. It, it's. <laughs> As you've just explained in the when we're talking about production chat, how much of this is based on what Wyatt Earp felt like narrating, you know, a lot of fiction. But it's as close, it's closer to the truth than, you know, than than most Westerns are about, you know, uh legends. And yeah, there's there's just I and I, my my reasoning was I think it feels choppy because it's it, because it's sticking to the facts. It yeah. doesn't feel like a tied up movie climactic end because it's so truthful that's how i walked away from this film then you tell me just in this podcast ladies and gentlemen this is done completely live um no that you were talking about how kurt russell came in saved the film obviously cut a lot of stuff out it now makes perfect sense to me i just feel like there's the the, the, this is not us i think being too overly critical in that he he spends a large t- amount of the of the film saying there's not enough about his his arc. His arc seems chopped. He spends about seventy percent of the film or eighty percent of the film saying I'm not a lawman. I don't do that anymore. The last bit is like right, it's revenge. I'm a lawman. I'm a U.S. marshal. I'll kill all of you. Tell him and I'm think, bringing hell with me. <laughs> I, I just I think there's just some bits, and I don't think it's about the time. I, I'm not saying it would be done better today, but it does feel chopped. It does feel like somebody's chopped it together. It, that, that, I think that does look, but the it is really the just the last end, like you were saying about what he's cut together. And I feel like you know, there's that montage where you mean the, the posse the, are chasing you mean, people. You mean down. the murder montage? <laughs> the murder montage where they're just shooting lots of men. Yeah, that's they were probably scenes in themselves, and Kurt's gone in and said no. No, it's far too long. So maybe it would have been, a te- uh, not maybe, this probably would have been a terrible film. It would have been overly long and the, the audience would have got bored. And You mean a bit a like brilliant- Wyatt Earp? <laughs> exactly. And he's done, he, you know, Roger Ebert described Wyatt Earp as just tombstone full with uh, hot air. And really? Yeah, yeah. He was not a fan. He was like, this is just, yeah. to, just, just wasting our time. And I think... I think Kurt's done a brilliant, Kurt and Mr. Kosnatos have done a great job on giving us this edit of this film, but it's, it's, it's just because you're so carried along and I love this film and I remember all the scenes and I think one of my favourite scenes in this film is, is well, there's two scenes. It's, it's between um, Michael Bean and Val Kilmer, both those scenes where they're quoting Latin to each other and he does the thing with the cup and then they're fine. Uh, well, I was going to say, how off. good are Michael Bean's uh, pistol skills? They're awesome. The man's obviously a gun nut, <laughs> but maybe, no, but I reckon Cameron probably put him through some extensive training and how many gun related roles has Michael Bean has? We've, we've oh, talked uh, about uh, two uh, of them, all... Navy yeah. SEALs. We've talked about a few of them already, you know? Yeah, that's um, true. That's true. But that is with a classic old, and that's the sort of thing that this, do you know what it reminded me of is that, is it just the eighties and nineties, that sort of level of dedication? It reminded me of Jack Nicholson with the cards and Batman. Yeah. You know, that it's obviously something I think. Might I'm going to keep you know, practicing. This is going to be my mo. Yeah. I, I think you, you, you're quite right to point it out and say, how good is he with a gun? I'm pretty sure he did it for this film, but he's obviously comfortable around guns from all of the, all of the roles he takes. He's always yeah. got a gun. Um, but yeah, I was, I, it's very impressive. And Kilmer's reaction is great, but that those two scenes are just, I have to ask the question because I can't remember. I think we were, we watching the Oscars back then, but the better, sorry, worst performances have been given best supporting actor than his performance in this. Oh, he was, he was, he was, was absolutely. He, was he, was he considered? Was he? No, he, he, he wasn't even nominated. I think That's he was terrible. He, he won like a, a most desirable male at the MTV movie awards, uh, for the performance, like bizarrely dying of TB, most desirable male Val Kilmer. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, he like, and I think that's one of the big injustices. I mean, I don't know if he, I'm assuming he was probably nominated for the Jim Morrison thing. The doors. I think let's go back to 993. Got to imagine who he's up against. In 993, you've got Tom Hanks and you've got Morgan Freeman knock him out of the park, you know, making yeah. very serious films. So I'm probably and Chris Walk and Robert De Niro, you know, Al Pacino, whatever. So 
maybe maybe this is a role that's not going to get picked up. But in this film, he stands out head and shoulders. Oh, I know. I would say I would say it's. Uh, I've got my notes. You know, uh, well, it's a question, but is it Val Kilmer's best performance? I, I'd say it is. Without I mean, doubt, well, for me, well, I mean, well, top, top, top secret, top secret. no, but top secret, and also um, the saint. The saint doesn't get enough love because of his uh, the disguises and that. The, it's still the, clearly the, Val Kilmer and all the disguises, in Charlie. It's a bit like Bruce Willis in that Jackal movie. Just lots of lovely wigs. Yeah, but also I'm going to wear a disguise, but I'm, I, I need to be recognisable. It's that yeah. double-edged sword. Uh, but no, Kilmer was um, amazing in this. And oh, I forgot uh, um, one of the other cameos, Billy Bob Thornton, is in it for about oh, yes. quite chubby Billy Bob Thornton for about three minutes. I got that. Yeah, he's the guy who gets reprimanded by... He's the bully, he, yeah. He gets made an example of. Yeah, I, I, I've, I've written that down. Um, I was trying to think, was there somebody else? Uh, I've just got Billy fucking Zane. Billy I was like, Zane. yeah, is, is, is that... Oh, yeah, I, I think a phrase that I need to use when, like, if I ever go in anywhere, and you need to use this as well, George, go into a club and it's time to say, this bird's jumping. This There's bird's some, jumping. There's some great. Uh, the, the only thing I don't think I enjoyed about this film, and I this is me going back to um, younger me, is the the love story, obligatory love story. That's <laughs> but I guess it, it's another fact that his wife was an addict and he left. But that's it's it. sort of like how do we make the fact that he's cheating on his wife acceptable? Well, his wife's a jun- an opium junkie. It's fine. She's a it's junkie. Fine. She, she's um, wasting away anyway. I just uh, I just have another headache. What? Oh my god Yeah Things that, that Kind of great I mean was Like what I'm thinking About is now the, Sometimes the facts Really help the plot along But the other times I think and This goes back to the thing About what's been cut out Like we don't see Morgan's killer You know Bill Paxton's role We don't see well, He yeah. shot through the window Maybe that's factual But it could have Easily been tied into another character That we well, used to I, You know So there's more coherence yeah. I did a little bit of reading And apparently like Yeah they've condensed it Into like a, a night of revenge But it's actually Months apart Those That's how those incidents Did happen He was shot And he died on a pool table So that is Actually true But it was like Six months after Virgil was Was shot and injured um, I'd, I'd see this as a this is the, a, a, a this is a creative this is a direct a directing save. This yeah, film could have absolutely. like been lost, and so the fact absolutely. that this film is considered above par is a cult classic. Is we're so lucky to have this film in in this entirety. It was obviously going to be shit, and yeah. it's been saved. So can't really pick too many holes in it. Well, and again, it's like it'd be interesting to think in a, in another world, in another in a parallel dimension, to you know release release the the Russell cut because apparently there was he like refers to it as like it was going to be a Western Godfather, it was going to be a, a big sprawling epic, and they obviously because of the issues had to trim it down. So it's there is loads of aficionados out there like. Oh, but and he said he would re- watch. Would Kurt Russell's like watch. he goes. I, I've got the I've got the reels probably in my garage somewhere. And he goes. I might I might go. I might revisit it at some point. But um, yeah. So apparently, there's loads of loads of footage that never made the. You know, there's never been obviously a director's cut. But yes, it's the what what could have been, which could lead me on to coulda, woulda, shoulda. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. So, coulda, woulda, shoulda is where George enlightens us into which other actors and their agents were contacted around the making of this film, who was considered for the roles. Uh, some, in some cases, like Bad Future, even got the roles, but didn't end up in the final cut. So, who have we got this time, George? So, uh, interestingly, uh, the original choice for Doc Holliday uh, was Willem Dafoe. Um, and it, it was... This Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, we love uh, Willem. We love yeah, Willem. We, we're Willem Dafoe. And even uh, Kurt Russell's just like, he would have been phenomenal. He would have been absolutely phenomenal. But it was Buena Vista said... No, um, uh, no to Willem Dafoe. I'm, I'm quite a gunslinger myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm something of a <laughs> something of a gunslinger myself. 
Well, apparently Buena Vista refused to cast him because Defoe played Jesus in Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ in the late 80s. So obviously Buena Vista being a Disney company didn't want to associate themselves. And it was all like, Val Kilmer is so hot right now. So uh, apparently Mickey Rourke turned down the role of Johnny Ringo. Wow. And in an interview in the late 1990s, John Carpenter claimed he also almost directed the film, which kind of makes sense because, like, Kurt's in a tight spot. Who's he going to yeah. call? But obviously, he's he probably not gonna... called him before he called Cosmatos. Or he, well, no, I think that's it. It's sort of like if I'm calling the shots, I'm not going to be telling John Carpenter what to do. <laughs> ah, right, yeah. That makes um, sense. But I have uh, so that's could have, would have, should have. But I have some bat trivia. So, oh. uh, Vulcan. Vulcan- <laughs> there we go. So Val Kilmer obviously played Doc Holliday and would uh, apparently when Joel Schumacher saw his performance in Tombstone was inspired to cast him as Batman in Batman Forever. Bruce Wayne. Wayne. <laughs> um, but uh, he's not the only Batman to have played Doc Holliday. Adam West himself has played uh, the character in not one, not two, but three different television productions. Straight for um, TV. Straight to TV in 1959 before he became the Bright Knight. Um, but also, not only just Adam West, but Cesar Romero. Um, oh my God, Mr. Mustache, Joker Mustache himself. Mr. Mustache, the Joker from the 1960s uh, Batman also played the role of Doc Holliday in Frontier Marshall in 1939. Wow. So there we you should go. look that we should we should look that up. But you're being totally serious. Lots of wise guys talking out the side of their mouths. What are you talking about, she? <laughs> um, so yes, there you go. You have uh, some various butt connections there. Like it. Are we going to give Mr. Costner his own like um, his own feature in this? We've got Kevin Costner copies KCC. We were going to go KKK, but marketing didn't like it, so we've got Kevin Costner so, copies. So, is there anything else to say other than he was totally fine with them carrying on with this production? He wasn't going to compete with them in any way, and he'd be totally fine if their film did well. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier on, but it, apparently. Costner's original intention for his white op he wanted to make it as a mini series but then they said at the studio i don't know if it was a money thing they said no you make it as a film and he's like okay well why don't we do it as like again like the godfather why don't we make it two parts and they're like no you're making one film but obviously Costner would go on to make i think he's made a few western tv series recently and some of them uh, one of them's supposed to be really good i think it's a hatfields and mccoys um but yes Costner has been you know, he's made countless Westerns and some of them are, are really good. Um, we love Kev, you know, as, as we touched on in Robin Hood. But yeah, I'm not, I mean, despite, I'm, I'm, I'm right in assuming you haven't seen White Earp as well. No, I, I, I think we were, we were the naysayers. We were just like, nah, nah, it's not, yeah. it's not, it's but, not I mean, the it's, other... It, it, it sounds like it's got a good cast. I think you've got Gene Hackman as one of the, the Earp brothers. You've got uh, Dennis, Dennis Quaid. Dennis as, Quaid's in it. As, as Doc Holliday. You've got it's some... just difficult to go and watch a similar story with different actors after you've seen a film like this. Yeah, opinion. and especially uh, when it's already people saying it's bloated, overlong, and <laughs> self-indulgent. Like, well, no, I'll just I'll watch Tombstone. That's slightly messy in the last half hour, but it's still a really rollicking good fun action you know it's it's you know a lot of the the best westerns were like b movies you know like the spaghetti westerns weren't you know they were they were made on the cheap and made cheap and cheap, cheaply and quickly but they were bloody entertaining and i think and they had yeah. nobody villains. They had no build up. It was just like they were just, and they goofies. were very ca- cardboard. Ca- yeah, they were cardboard cutout sort of villains. But the villains in this, yes, they are very clearly like Powers Pete. Booth. Oh Powers, my god, Powers Booth is fantastic. And again, he makes a name of himself for being Western bad guys. I think he cropped up in Deadwood, um, and in Sin City as well. Um, yeah, he's got a fantastic voice. Um, oh God. But he's also like, um, he's become a, a great meme, that bit where um, the, the Earps uh, are leaving town and he just goes, well, 
Bye. This <laughs> 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 is like as they're leaving with the hearse. But yeah, how how evil are they? You know, that opening scene where they murder an entire wedding party and the priest. <laughs> yeah, just to show that they're. I yeah. read somewhere that they're. That's actually the law. They're the local police. It's a policeman's wedding. Well, that's the one the thing I couldn't uh, get my head around, and I could have easily done research, but I didn't do it. But the thing that confused me in this film is what's the difference between a, a sheriff and a marshal? Because obviously you've got the corrupt sheriff in this who just is bought by people and obsessed with, you know, the other guy in the bowler hat, I can't remember what, um, who ends up working with the cowboys. But then you have... The Europe's are marshals. So are they so different this, divisions? The same in the States, you've got um, local, state, fed. So the U.S. marshals are, would be would be federal and the state's different. So like in France, when we say the state or in the U.K., the state schools, we're talking about the entire country. Right. And in the United States, you're talking about the, the state, individual states. Yeah. But so, yeah, there's like the state authority. We're going too much into this. I don't know what I'm talking about. But all I can say is that there's like this federal and the state. Well, that was so, the thing I didn't, I was a little bit confused about. In terms I, don't, of- I don't know. I don't know which is which, but I just I, yeah. it makes sense that there's the local police. There's a state, there's a federal marshal and then there's state police equivalent, I guess. But what I love about and it's not it's just the, the whole ju- not my jurisdiction bullshit that you see in movies today. That's the, the FBI's stick. Tread oh, yeah. toes everywhere. It's that still state county. Uh, they've got all of their yeah. departments and organizations, and you know, but the, the, the thing I love about westerns in, in general is like, do you want to be a sheriff? Yeah, here's a badge. You're not a sheriff. Just that, like, I guess that's how it was. Yeah, a lot of things were done on a. This is touched on in, I think, in uh, you know, when you see about the bounties and stuff, and we have, we've seen this most recently in um, Django. The fact that that was so like the guy and it's shown in the film, it's like he just goes up and kills a guy in cold blood in the street. And everyone's like, well, that's that. I've got a bounty. They're like, oh, okay. You know, so we talk about things being like in the Wild West where it was the quick and the dead. You know, it's yeah. like, hey, that's uh, that. yeah, exactly. That's another great film. Well, that's another yeah. great film with another amazing cast. Um, Is that Gene Hackman, Sharon Stone, and Russell Crowe, Leonardo DiCaprio, Lance Henriksen. Oh, it'll it'll feature on retro. Yeah, no, it's, I watched it recently. It's it's uh, Sam Raimi Weston. It's great fun, but uh, and again, yeah, I think made around that would have been what late late nineties, late nineties, so ni- mid nineties. I think it's ninety five. I think exactly. it's, it's, it's yeah. uh, Sharon Stone hot off uh, her basic instinct uh, success because she produces it and stuff. Um, but anyway, what I was going to say? Oh yeah, the the other thing that isn't covered in in the realism that I was reading at my research is apparently what was he called Ike Clanton actually uh, took. The oops, there was a massive court case after the, sh- the, the gunfight at the OK Corral. Um, and they were all they, Yeah, there was a lengthy uh, court case that a 30 day preliminary he- uh, hearing and they had uh, a brief stint in, in jail. But then it was shown that the oops had acted lawfully. So, again, it's that, as you're saying, that lawlessness. But, yeah, where's the court case? <laughs> It's still there today. There's there's lots of elements that are still relevant today, and we don't want to get tied down into gun control. But the Second Amendment right, it comes from the time of the West. It's like my right to bear arms. No, but it's like John Heston. If you read the text, it go it dates back to if the sheriff was out of town and the town was being threatened, then any civilian has the right to bear arms to form a posse. And bear mm. arms to protect the town. And that's the Second Amendment that's being used. So anyway, yeah. it's uh, from the Wild West. It's it's from Westerns. And I think people are going to mm. keep going back to that well, drinking from it. We had, what was it, Cowboys and Aliens with them? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. That was that was Hollywood taking the piss. Like, okay, nobody's ever seen. We've got Cowboys. Yep. we got Aliens. Well, that- yep. Well, it's it's again, it's it's like one of those things on paper. It sounds pretty good in terms of oh yeah, it's a John Favreau uh, of just after he made Iron Man, Daniel Craig, hot off Bond, Harrison Ford, I think Sam Rockwell's in it. You know, it's great cast, an interesting concept. And Makes no sense. I was I was just thinking the other day. I was like, maybe I should go and rewatch our films. Like, no, 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 life's too short. I say I've got. Um, Bone Tomahawk on the list, but apparently that's like really, really gory because it's like 
it's a bit i think it sounds like a bit dust till dawn it's like first half is a western and then it turns into a cannibal movie so wow. i'm not not in a rush you know you we, you know we don't like a horror i'm scared i just don't want to watch it alone but okay. you know kurt, kurt russell does have an amazing mustache in it so that's uh, that's an incentive for me to watch some people say follow the money we on this podcast we say follow the mustache so anything else you want to add about um tombstone while we're at it because we will move on we will move on from here uh no no as, as i say you know it's i, I do you know it's a, it's wanna... a cult classic it's amazing we enjoyed it it's just after all the films we review on this podcast going back to it now you do look at some films just watch better than others and there were just a few bits where and, you, it was just obvious yeah. what's happened to this film it's obvious to see that watching it today. You're like, okay, there's obviously been some editing. There's obviously been some big decisions made. Yeah. We're lucky to have this film for whatever reason. Yeah. And yeah, th- there's a lot of reasons to go back and revisit it. So yeah, I think I think that's it for, for this episode. Great. Well, thank you for listening. Um, this has been a typical Retro Ramble production. Uh, as you will have seen, we are covering... Uh, we're getting fast and loose for all our Patreon subscribers. We're covering uh, films that passed us by with Retro Ramble Revelations. Uh, we've obviously done some recent rambles on uh, films around the cinema, like The Batman, uh, that Spider-Man film that was out, and there'll be Bond. more to come. Bond, yeah, then No Time to Die. Uh, so we'll co- there's there's more. There's, there's but, a lot more. We've, yeah, we've done a few of our Revelations episodes, so they are the, the films that Charlie and I didn't get round to watching uh, first time when we were, were growing up in the 80s and 90s. So we've only uh, covered two cult classics so far, but we've done uh, Roadhouse, as we, we discussed earlier in the episode. And most recently, it's just uh, come out, um, is The Warriors. So not just about the new stuff. It's a nice mix of, of old new, and just a, a chance for us to do something a little bit different. So um, if you'd like to support us, uh, that would be greatly appreciated by charlie and myself but thank you for listening to these episodes we've still got lots of films to go through Mm. um we top gun maverick is coming we're not sure when that will come but it's coming out in the cinema at some point in may uh we're not sure when we'll release it we'll cover it on this podcast but we will be trying to tie that in with obviously the original top gun um so yeah watch out for that and much much more so for this episode i've been charlie mcgee i've been george mcgee and we'll see you next time. Sorry, I should have said, I'm, I'm your Huckleberry. <laughs> well, yeah, you, you can't go a whole episode without saying that, really. Yeah. Uh, uh, but thanks for listening. Um, see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I want you to know it's over. Well, bye.